Hi, this is Stephanie Eckler, and I am doing a voiceover PowerPoint for the legal implications of nursing. This is chapter seven. And so on this first power slide, we kind of introduce um, what does it mean concerning legal implications? And, you know, in modern practice of nursing, um, your book starts out and kind of discusses that nowadays nurses, we are responsible for assessing our patients. Um, we diagnose them, and not as if a physician gives a diagnosis, but more as we give that nursing diagnosis or we identify that nursing problem. And we go on to um, kind of plan care based on what we identify as a problem. We implement interventions to try to fix those problems, and we evaluate our nursing care. And with that said, um, we have full legal responsibility and accountability for the nursing actions that we choose with our patients. So we need to be aware that um, what is our legal accountability. And so I really like this chapter. We're going to go over some different topics, do some examples. But um, a lot of the research out there has um, suggested that if a patient feels like they had a, um, that they were cared for and they had a, um, a good amount of quality care that they're less likely to sue. So in this PowerPoint, it talks about nurses who wish to avoid legal conflicts need to, number one, develop that trusting nurse-patient relationship. And we talked about that in our communication chapter um, because satisfied patients rarely complain or sue. Um, we also, a big one that we're going to talk about through this chapter is our, um, our nurse practice acts. And they define um, our scope of practice. And we have to make sure that we are practicing within that scope. And then we also need to be identifying potential liabilities in our practice and work to prevent those. So as we go through, um, the beginning of this chapter kind of talks through some definitions. And then we'll get into some of more of these topics of how we can prevent um, from finding ourselves into a, in a lawsuit. So as we begin, um, or you begin in professional practice, <clears throat> it is essential that you understand how the law defines the nurse's legal responsibilities or duties. So the definition your textbook gives for um, what a law is, it's a standard or rule of contact, or conduct established and enforced by government, and it's designed to protect the rights of the public. The next slide kind of talks about types of law, but I'm going to kind of jump ahead. Um, we have um, several different types of laws. For example, public law is in which the government is um, involved directly, and it, re it regulates relationships between people and the government. Um, private law, or sometimes this is referred to as civil law, it regulates relationships among people. So um, civil law includes laws that relate to contracts or ownership of property, but it also relates to the practice of nursing, medicine, and pharmacy. Um, and I kind of think about private law or civil law um, and, you know, how it relates to nursing. You know, we have these um, HIPAA rules. So that's kind of a contract with the patient. They come in, they're aware of their um, our HIPAA policies, and then if a nurse breaks that, um, you know, that is an example of a private law or a civil law that they have broke. Um, your book also talks about criminal law, and so criminal law is a type of public law that concerns state and federal criminal statutes, um, which define what a criminal action is. So it gives examples. Criminal law would be those things you you know, you think of and you see um, TV shows on, like murder, manslaughter, but it's also about criminal negligence. And as we go through this PowerPoint, we're going to talk more about negligence, what's required to prove negligence, because that's a big area for nursing. Um, if we are not practicing in our um, uh, scope of practice, or if we are not doing things that a, um, that a, a nurse would or should know how to do, um, then we risk being um, negligent to our patients. So as we go through again, we will give some examples of that. But I'm going to kind of skip the next slide because I've kind of just given you those definitions. Again, um, the beginning of the book is full of lots of definitions. Um, but as I said, we will talk more about um, negligence and the, and the areas that I think are um, prudent to talk about concerning nursing. 
The previous slide um, listed the types of laws. This slide is about um, the four sources of our laws. So, you know, how do we how do we come up with these laws? And you have four sources. Um, the first one is your um, constitution or the constitutions, and they serve as a guide to the legislative body. Um, so your book talks about the federal and state constitutions indicate how the federal and state government are created, and they give authority and state the principles and provisions for establish, establishing specific laws. So that is just one of those basic definitions. Um, the one that we begin to talk about to really um, influences nursing is our statutory laws. So these um, statutory laws, they must be in keeping with both the federal and state constitutions, but Nurse Practice Acts are examples of st um, st um, statutory law. And all the Nurse Practice Act is, is it's broadly defining the legal scope of our nursing practice. So it's kind of laying down those rules for nurses. Um, the next type kind of plays into the statutory laws. We've laid down the rules of how nurses should practice or what their scope is. And then we have administrative law. So we have um, um, bodies. So for nursing, we have the um, State Board of Nursing, which is responsible um, for uh, administrative facilities at the state level. Um, and they're responsible for enforcing the rules and regulations. Um, so, you know, we statutory lays down the rules. And then if you aren't following them, if you um, are stealing narcotics from your patient to take yourself, you're going to end up in front of the um, State Board of Nursing because they're going to um, enforce the scope of practice and, um, and, it, and they're responsible for those administrative laws or keeping, that, um, keeping everybody with following the statutory laws. Um, common law, your book gives a definition. Common law, it has evolved from accumulated um, judiciary decisions. So thus, common law has been made from court-made decisions. Um, so basically, after this, you know, after a case has been ruled on in the court system or a decision has been made, um, the principles in that decision become the rule to follow in similar cases. Um, and in the case that uh, first, first sets down the rule by um, decision is called the pres uh, president. So, you know, we think about common law, and, it, and common law helps prevent one set of rules from being used to judge um, one person and another set to judge another person in similar circumstances. So it is there so that we are treating everybody the same way um, when there's similar circumstances involved in the case. And you'll see... Um, this is discussed a lot with um, most of the cases with malpractice. Um, the rules for that come from common law. Again, more terminology at the beginning of your chapter. Um, so this is more law terminology. And basically, you will hear these terms. Um, and the first one is a lawsuit. What is a lawsuit? Um, and that is just um, a civil action brought in the court of law. So a legal action. Um, so, you know, if um, they feel like you were negligent with a patient, um, the family may bring a lawsuit or this legal action to the court. The definition for litigation is the process of bringing and trying the lawsuit. So once somebody has um, placed a legal action against you or a lawsuit against you, then there will be due process and you and there will be litigation um, or trying of the case. The plaintiff is the person bringing the suit against another. Um, and then the defendant is obviously the person who's being accused of the crime. Um, and everybody is always presumed innocent until they are proven guilty. This slide is to talk about professional and legal regulation of nursing practice. So we've already talked about we have Nurse Practice Acts and those laws that govern our practice. And in your um, course calendar, I think it was the first week, we said to review um, the Nurse Practice Act for Indiana. And um, 
to review that scope of practice. And I'm not sure we ever gave you the link. So I have put the link in here so that you can go to that um, site and you can kind of read through what is included in the Nurse Practice Act. And again, it is a very broad um, layout of, of what is defined in there. Um, but we are also um, regulated through some standards which are just voluntary. Um, is, they're not um, legal and we're going to talk about that through this PowerPoint. And then we're also um, regulated through credentialing. So we're going to go through the next two or three slides and talk about each of those and what those mean. So Nurse Practice Acts. So every state or um, each state in the United States has a Nurse Practice Act that protects the public by broadly defining the legal scope of nursing practice. And it is there, again, to protect the public. Um, we cannot practice beyond the limits stated. It lists violations that can result in disciplinary action. And with disciplinary action, your license could be suspended or revoked altogether. And I went to the link that was on the previous slide and started reading some of it. Um, some of the issues that it talks about concerning um, reasons your license could be revoked, um, a lot of it includes um, possession of illegal drugs, dealing um, illegal drugs. But there was one that I hadn't realized that was in there that was defined, and that is failure to pay child support. Um, so if there is a claim against you because you have not paid your child support, and um, that will be sent to the Board of Nursing, and they could suspend or um, revoke your nursing license for that. So it does lay those type of things out for you. Um, but it also guides our practice in that it serves to exclude unlicensed people from practicing nursing. Um, so again, I highly recommend that you um, go in there and look at those Nurse Practice Acts. It also defines, it breaks it out um, based on licensed um, professional nurse, so the LPN versus the RN. And I found it really interesting. Um, it defined the scope for the LPN that they're allowed to assist in assessing the patient. And so, you know, the hospital I'm at, like the, the LPNs, um, they can't do that initial head-to-toe admission assessment, but then they can continue to do ongoing assessments. So if you get a brand new admission at the hospital, um, and I'm at community, um, an RN has to do that first head-to-toe assessment. But then after that, the LPN can um, take that patient and they can continue to do assessments ongoing after that. Um, and again, the LPN is... Um, practicing under the RN. So just understanding that delegation and, and what's included in each, in each scope is very important. Before I talk about this next slide, I forgot to mention it on the previous slide, but there is a great table in your book on page 123. It's table 7-1 and it talks about who makes nursing practice rules. So it kind of gives you um, the source of practice rules, whether it's at the federal, state, the Board of Nursing, and it gives you examples that are covered at each of those level. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that your attention. It is, it is um, a little extra source that you can look at regarding this topic. So we go on, and a couple of slides ago I mentioned standards, and they can be voluntary. So when we have voluntary standards, these are not mandatory, but they are used to um, provide guidelines for peer review. Um, and a lot of times they come from um, professional nursing organizations. And those organizations are um, continually um, assessing the function and standards and qualifications of their members. And these organizations are guided by their own assessment of society's needs for nursing and by the public's expectation of nursing. So an example of voluntary standards include the American Nurse Association has standards of practice. And there is examples of those standards of practice in Chapter 1 of your textbook. But these are what we would call um, voluntary professional standards um, that often kind of can direct the care of a patient um, and then we also, the book talks about legal standards. So we do have actual legal standards, um, and they are just implemented um, by legislature, um, and they uh, grant the, or they're, 
They're implemented by the authority granted by the states to determine the minimum standard um, for the education of nurses. It sets the requirements for licensure, and it decides when a nurse's license may be suspended or revoked. So these standards impact our Nurse Practice Act. So as I stated, we have legal standards such as the minimum um, education a nurse needs um, or the requirements for licensure. So what kind of plays in with that is our credentialing. And this is a way in which professional competence is ensured and maintained. And there's um, three um, kind of processes involved in this. And the first is accreditation. So that is the process by which an educational program is evaluated and recognized as having met these standards. So most schools seek either the NL, NAC, or the AAC in accreditation. And again, these are voluntary accreditations. Um, it says it's not a legal requirement to have these, um, but it is better to attend a school that is accredited because if we are accredited, for instance, Ivy Tech is an accredited nursing school, um, we are ensuring that um, we are making sure that we are meeting the professional competence that is needed for the nursing profession. Um, so, again, a lot of times employers will want to know um, what school did you go to because they want to make sure you are coming from an accredited institution. The next um, part of that credentialing and the first part or the first step was the accreditation. The next part is licensures and candidates um, must meet a certain minimum requirement to be granted a license. And so we've kind of talked about um, that is outlined in your Nursing Practice, um, practice Act. But a license may not be revoked without due process. So drug or alcohol abuse is the most frequent reason for license re um, to be revoked. And again, if that is going to happen, you will get a letter um, stating, you know, the charge or, you know, that your license is being suspended or possibly revoked. And you will be allowed to have due process to defend that. Um, other um, possible reasons why your license may be revoked include fraud, deceptive practices, um, possibly, you know, negligence again. Um, or, you know, if somehow you've demonstrated physical or mental impairments. The third step of that credentialing is certification. And that's the process by which a person who has met certain criteria established by non-governmental associations is granted a recognition in a certain practice. So, you know, we talked about those voluntary standards um, from different professional organisms. So different professional organisms also have programs where you can continue your study um, and, and take certification tests and have those extra credentials. Um, and so some examples here are the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. They offer um, extra credentials. Um, I've seen um, in hospitals there's been educators who specialize in diabetes, and they may take some extra courses or um, study and get some certification behind that. And that just means that they are um, have advanced knowledge um, in that special area. Um, so a certification is good to have. I think I already hit on this uh, a couple of slides ago, but as I said, there is due process or due cause for revoking a license. So there's always a letter that I said was sent out um, in notice of investigation. Um, you always will have a fair and impartial hearing regarding um, the investigation and what they want to do with your license. And then a proper decision will be based um, on the evidence that is presented of that. So very similar to our own legal system, that is how it works with your licensure. Your book goes on to discuss criminal law. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of the chapter, we went over a lot of definitions of concerning um, what a law is and the different types of laws. And we hit on criminal law just slightly. But... Um, when we think about criminal law or a crime, this is a wrong against a person um, or his or her property as well as the public with intent. There was intent for it. The government usually prosecutes this, and there's two levels of it. Um, it can be considered a misdemeanor, which is a lesser charge. It's punishable by fines, 
or um, imprisonment of less than one year, where a felony is a more serious charge and it's punishable by imprisonment for more than one year. And your book talks about um, a tort as well. And so this is a little bit different than, a, than the crime, and it's a wrong committed by a person against another person um, or his or her property, and it's more of a civil matter. So um, the subject, or the tort is the subject to action in a civil court, um, and usually with damages um, being settled with money. So this can be intentional or unintentional, and this is where we get into negligence. So if it's intentional, that might be considered assault, invasion of privacy, right? There is your HIPAA violations, um, false imprisonment. So if you, um, you know, we had the chapter of restraints, and we always try to um, not use restraints, and at times it is needed, um, for the safety of the patient. But if we are putting restraints on a patient because we just don't want to deal with them, that's false imprisonment. And then as far as towards unintentional acts of negligence. And so we're going to talk about, you know, what that means and ha what has to be proven for somebody to be liable with that. And that is in a couple of slides coming up. But just be aware of the difference in those, you know, um, and, and, you know, sometimes negligence, if it's bad enough and it caused a patient um, to lose their life, you may see the patient even be prosecuted um, for a crime of murder or, you know, things like that. So there's a fine line and they are um, interrelated. So um, this slide is just giving you examples of intentional torts. And again, I'm really bad about kind of already talking about a few of these on the previous slide. And then they're listed here for you. But intentional torts, assault, and battery, um, forcing care or treatment of a competent patient. So if a patient, or every patient has the right to refuse treatment, and if you, re, you know, and they're, if they're competent and able to make that decision, and you force that, um, that could be considered assault or battery. Defamation of character, so slander, um, and that can be verbal or in um, writing, and that's false or exaggerated statements about a patient or coworker. So I always, this is a good time to um, talk to students and and just ha make them aware. Watch what you're saying in public settings. So watch what you're saying in the hall outside your patient's room. Watch what you're saying at the nurse's station. And believe me, we've all had patients that are frustrating and um, drive us crazy. But we have to watch what we're saying because if somebody overhears us, um, you know, making derogatory comments like, oh my gosh, that patient is crazy, um, they've lost their mind, yada, 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 um, they could sue us for defamation of character or slander. So again, being aware of your surroundings, not going to the lunchroom or the cafeteria at lunch and talking about your patient, very important. Um, invasion of privacy, I think the next slide coming up even has some examples or a list of um, what falls under HIPAA. False imprisonment, I just mentioned that. Restraints, holding against um, will. If we're not using restraints in the correct manner, if we're not following the procedure for applying restraints, checking those restraints and removing them, we could be false in, um, prison, or, you know, doing false imprisonment to our patients. And then fraud. So that's misrepresentation capable of causing harm. HIPAA. You may already know a lot about HIPAA. It's been around for... Um, quite a few years now, and this ensures that patients have the following rights. And so every patient is entitled to see a copy of their health record, um, and they can update their health record if needed, and they can request a, re a correction of any mistakes. Now, often you will see in um, health facilities that if a patient wants to look at their health record and um, and especially if they want to make corrections, usually they will have the physician be present while the patient is looking at their health record. Um, they also have the right to get a list of the disclosures a healthcare institution has made independent of the disclosures made for purpose of treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. They have the right to request restrictions on certain uses or disclosure. Um, and you will often see um, 
patients sometimes do request this, they may request that no information be given out about them. And so if that's the case, and um, somebody, a family member calls and asks about Jean Bray, um, we're not even allowed to acknowledge that um, that patient is present, or we're not allowed to give that information out over the phone if there's a restriction in place. And sometimes um, facilities will have... Um, you know, a password for the family member so that they can call, but that person has to have the password um, in order to get any information on their loved one. Um, and that's usually related to some type of restriction that the patient has requested. They also can choose how to receive their health information. So this is the slide that I think is very, very important for students to review this information. And that is that there are certain acts by nurses that could constitute an invasion of privacy um, and break HIPAA um, rules. And so your book has um, some of these examples in box 7-2 on page 127. There are also a couple of bullet points related to this on page 126 that talk about HIPAA. And, you know, if there's any violation with HIPAA, it could include... Um, punishments. Um, a lot of times it's financial, so um, institutions have to pay a lot of money out um, if there is proof that they did violate this. So this is very serious for institutions, and they're going to want their employees to comply with this. Um, something we often don't think about is a HIPAA violation, but you know, if you're getting your patient out of bed, and they just have a hospital gown on, and the back of it's open showing um, um, their um, bottom, and you didn't provide the necessary privacy, so you didn't shut the door, you didn't pull a curtain, and somebody walks by and sees that, you've just invaded that patient's privacy. So, um, you know, it's, it's very important. It's why in Skills Lab we're teaching you to pull the curtain um, or shut the door because we want to ensure from the very beginning that you guys are providing privacy for your patient and you're not caught with a situation like this. Um, another one that I just want to highlight that I've um, underlined on here that I see students do a lot is we will have assignments for you in clinical and you will need information from the patient's chart. But many times um, the written information we see students take down also conceals the patient's identity. So when you are making notes or writing things down on your patient, you can't put their patient name on it. Um, it can't have their age. You have to be careful um, about those type of things, their room number, because any of that could identify that patient. And you may need your patient's name and their room number during the day while you're in clinical, and that's fine to write it down. You just cannot leave the floor with that information because if it would get lost, if um, somebody else would see it um, at home, then that would be a HIPAA violation. I don't know if it's listed on here, but I always warn students, too, you know, you shouldn't be going home and really, you know, telling um, your spouse the patient's name that you took care of or telling a ton of things um, about that patient that could identify them in any way. Likewise, I kind of hit on not talking about patients in a very public area, such as an elevator or um, in, the, in the cafeteria, because again, anybody can overhear that and that would be considered a violation. So I really want to stress, I think students should really look at this information and be knowledgeable with it. So we're going to talk about unintentional torts on this um, PowerPoint, and that includes negligence or malpractice, and that's performing an act that a reasonable, prudent person would not do. Um, and negligence can be an omission or commission, and it's based on, again, what, what would a reasonable person do in similar circumstances? So when you think about nursing, what would you know, what is the standard of care, and what would a normal or a, a nurse do if they were in similar circumstances. It is based on the level of training, and you do have to establish four elements of liability to prove neglect. Um, malpractice is often the term generally used to describe negligence by the professional um, personnel. So the next slide, we're going to talk about the four elements of liability. But what I want you to take a minute and do before we move on to that next slide is I have put a link up here. Um, it is a Z-Dog video. 
it is about 15 minutes long. And honestly, if you want to listen into about, I mean, the first maybe 10 minutes, you can stop after that. But it is about um, a medication error that happened at Vanderbilt um, concerning a nurse. And I think it really drives home the point of um, the element of liability, which we're going to talk about the next slide. So before you move on, you know, copy this link um, on your computer and go and watch this video. So I hope you took a few minutes to go and watch that, you know, video. It is fairly long, but it is a great example of negligence that happened and how safety measures did not work. And ultimately, you know, yes, yeah, should the hospital have had that medication in the uh, Pixis machine um, for anybody to get? Should the nurse, you know, should... Um, staff be able to do the overrides. Um, there was a lot of breakdown in the safety measures in place for that man, but ultimately it was a person who did not um, take the time to check their medication and did not take the time to monitor their patient and it ultimately caused this patient um, to pass or to die. So as I, I always feel like this is a great video to kind of drive home a point as you're going into the skills lab and you begin to learn how to administer a medication. And you're going to be talking about the six rights that you check and how you check them three times on the patient before you ever administer that medication. Um, so you're always checking for, do I have the right patient? Do I have the right medication? Do I have the right dose? and on and on and on. And you're doing that three separate times. And you should be checking that medication. Is this the correct um, you know, order for this medication? So you're checking that with the physician's order. And you know, the reason we have you practice things in the skills lab, and we want you to practice and practice and practice, um, you know, and you think, well, it's not that hard to give a medication. But, you know, the more you practice something, the more it becomes remote memory for you and you just do it when you get out in practice um, as a nurse. And I, what I've seen students do is they will practice for this competency in skills lab as far as, you know, we're going to check you off on medication administration. And they practice saying what they're supposed to say. So they practice saying, I do have the right patient. I do have the right medication. Um... I have the right dose, I check the doctor's order, um, and they do it at the right times within the competency, but they're so busy practicing just saying those things at home, but are they actually looking at the medicine? So I once um, had a student one semester, um, and she failed the competency because she was supposed to give some potassium, um, and the order was for 40 uh, mega equivalents, which is how the medication comes. And um, she kept saying, I have the right patient. I have potassium. It is 40 mega equivalents. And, you know, before she went to actually give the medication to the patient, I even prompted her several times and said, have you done everything you need to do with that medication before you administer it? And she said yes. Um, and then she gave the med. And, of course, I failed her. She had to come back and give a medication again because what she had was one tablet that was 20 mega equivalents. And so she really needed two tablets. But she was so busy in practicing and saying the terms, but she didn't really look at her medication. In this video that I had you watch, kind of the same thing. The nurse was in a hurry, maybe, or she wasn't familiar with that situation. And, you know, she punched in the first two letters, V-E for for said, um, but she punched in, you know, for said is the trade name. And most medications in the Pixis are under the generic name. And she pulls this med, and she doesn't check it um, and do her checks properly. And it ultimately, um, the patient passed away from the heirs. And it, all it would have took was stopping and doing it three different times and checking that medication. So this ties in. This is a great, um, you know, you're headed into the skills lab soon to do medication, to think about that when you're checking your meds. But also it ties into the, um, negligence and what has to be proven um, in order to find somebody liable of negligence. And so this PowerPoint leads into that. So we have a duty, an obligation to provide due care or standard of care for the patient. So um, this nurse did have a duty to do that. 
and she failed to do that. The breach of duty is the failure to provide that due care. So whatever a prudent nurse in that same situation, which I've talked about in previous slides, would have done, she failed to do that. So, you know, all of us as nurses learn, we check our med. Um, you know, we do it three different times. We check it with the order. Um, and she just failed to do that at this point. The causation. So did failure to meet that standard of care actually cause injury to the patient? And by watching that video, you know, the patient ultimately stopped breathing and, um, and died from it. So it did cause an injury to that patient and then damages actual harm to the patient, which kind of go into, did it cause something to go wrong? And yes. Um, so again, I think it's a great video that ties in with this. I hope you took a few minutes to watch it. There are some follow-up videos to that. If you Google Z-Dog, um, Vanderbilt nurse, he does a follow-up video where the nurse was actually, um, she was charged with, um, reckless homicide. Um, and I'm not sure where her case is at because this incident happened in 2017. Probably charges weren't brought until like 2018 maybe. Um, so I'm not sure where that, if the charges were ever dropped for the reckless homicide or if she's still awaiting trial. I'm not sure where all that is. And I'm sure if you spent time Googling it, you could find out some more information about it. But it's just to make you aware that, um, you know, serious consequences to, you know, you being able to practice as a nurse can happen. And, I mean, the devastation that this nurse must feel, you know, to to cause a patient to pass away or die from the errors that you made, um, I'm sure are worse than any consequences of possibly going to jail or losing your license. So just thinking about that, when you get into the skills lab and you begin to um, learn how to pass a medication and being aware of not following those steps can lead to these four things happening and you being liable. So this next slide talks about malpractice um, and then the common categories that claims are made. So, you know, if you, um, proof of malpractice, we prove that there's negligence um, or liability involved. And your book has these nicely laid out in bullet points within the reading on page 127. But some of these, um, we've already talked about the failure to follow standard of care. You know, that video was a great example. We talked about that. Failure to use equipment in a responsible manner is another one. And it does give you examples with these. So for that one, it says you attempt to use a bariatric patient lift for the first time without getting help, and the patient falls. So you uh, may be negligent in that situation. Failure to assess and monitor your patient. Again, that video is an example of, you know, that nurse gave us a what she thought was Versed medication, and she didn't monitor the patient. Um, but you, you know, the example in the textbook for that is you fail to follow your hospital standards for post-operative assessment after receiving a patient from the operating room, um, and response to a ruptured suture line is delayed. So that's another example your textbook gives. Gives. I think the um, the video that Z Dog does is a much better example of failure to assess and monitor a patient. Failure to communicate. So we talked a lot about in the communication that SBAR and giving that information. Your textbook gives an example here. You fail to communicate your concern about an older adult patient being discharged home. She lives alone. The patient is soon rehospitalized because no provisions were made to secure the nursing care she needed after discharge. So again, that was failure to um, when you're reporting off or when you're um, having concerns about patient and you're not reporting those, so you fail to communicate. Failure to document. So we will never be able to say this enough, but if you don't document it, it means you did not do it. Um, and so if you ever get pulled into any kind of lawsuit um, and you didn't document it, they're going to say, well, you know, it's not written here that you did that. Um, so you always want to document, document, document. Um, the textbook um, gives an example and it states, you believe a patient is in danger of arresting, but you repeated calls to the healthcare provider to see the patient, to see the patient, and they are ignored. So you work up the chain of command before any healthcare provider sees the patient, he arrests, and despite the code, dies. 
You document the rest and the code and the death. However, you fail to document all the steps you took to get the patient's medical attention. So if you didn't document, there's no proof that you did anything for this patient. Um, so again, I cannot stress how important documentation is, and we need to make sure we're documenting everything. And then to failure to act as a patient advocate. Um, again, in your book, gives an example of that. Um, you're in the operating room and watch a surgeon break the sterile field twice. No one else seems to notice. You're intimidated by the surgeon and fail to bring this to anyone's attention. You learn that the patient developed a serious infection postoperatively. So we are, we do need to be a patient's advocate. So um, learning to speak up when you see something that's not correct. And you can start doing this when you're um, checking off your peers, you know, when you start putting in Foley catheters or doing sterile dressing changes and you're supposed to be watching your peer, you need to speak up and say, hey, you just broke sterile field. Hey, you didn't put your gloves on right. That's a great way to get in the practice of just speaking up for your patients. So again, these are just where the common um, categories or claims are for malpractice. Um, and we don't want any student to ever fall into one of these. This slide just talks about the outcomes of a malpractice litigation. This is in your textbook on page 128, um, but it kind of goes, basically all parties will work towards a fair settlement. So sometimes, um, you know, it, let's say um, there's been cases where um, maybe the patient was supposed to have their left leg removed and they accidentally removed the right leg. And so it's possible that you know, a claim was made and then within the hospital, they worked out um, without being in court, worked out a fair settlement um, for that claim. The next one is the case is presented to a malpractice arbitration panel. <coughs> and then lastly, the case is brought to trial court. Um, and the hope is that it, it never gets taken to trial court. But if that was the case, um, there would be a um, the defendant which is the person being accused. Um, and then there would be some pretrial discovery activities where they review medical records, they would interview witnesses. There would be a trial that takes place in which both sides get to present their evidence and arguments. And then a decision or verdict would be reached by the judge or a jury. Um, and then the next slide that's coming up is kind of the roles of nurses in legal proceedings. Um, and so it'll kind of discuss or it says, you know, you as a nurse could be the defendant. And that's the kind of thing we've been talking about through this whole um, PowerPoint is, do you know your scope of practice? Do you know what the standard of care is? Um, are you acting as a uh, prudent nurse would in that um, circumstance? Because we never want you to become the nurse as a defendant. Um, the next one is you might be a nurse um, that's called in for these legal proceedings to be a fact, fact witness um, or firsthand knowledge. So maybe you witnessed something or you saw something. So um, maybe you saw, maybe there was a medical error that, you know, injured a patient, harmed a patient um, by a nurse and um, you saw that she was impaired in some way. Um, maybe you saw her out in the parking lot, you know doing drugs. So, I mean, that's, I'm just making this up, but you could be called as a fat witness or, you know, maybe you had firsthand knowledge of what happened. And then, um, the other way nurses may be involved in legal proceedings is just the nurse as an expert witness. Um, and you just offer your opinion about nursing care and if, if it met the acceptable standard of care. So, um, I'm not going to talk on the next PowerPoint cause I just kind of went over it here, but again, um, the whole point of going over this legal chapter is to teach you um, the legal system, what could happen, and hopefully teach you, um, you know, what things to do or what things to review so that you are never in this, um, these circumstances. So I skipped over that last slide. Um, there wasn't any voice recording with it. Um, but this slide is about recommendations for a nurse. If you are ever in, in a situation um, where charges are being brought to you um, and you're going to trial and you are the defendant, um, these are just some tips that your book recommends. And, it, and it's true. You don't want to discuss the case um, with anybody that's involved in it. Um, so your coworkers, you know, the physicians, you, you don't want to do that. 
you don't ever want to alter patient records. Um, that's why it's so important that you document, 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 but you can't go back in and say, oh, I forgot to document that and I'm going to add it now. That No, you can't go in and alter patient records. Um, you need to cooperate fully with your attorney. You need to be courteous on the witness stand and you don't volunteer any information. You only answer the questions that are asked of you. So the next three slides are all um, legal safeguards for nurses. Um, well, the next two are legal safeguards for nurses and just uh, the third slide is safeguards to competent practice. So I'm kind of kind of hit on these. Your book um, starts discussing this um, and it's several pages long. It starts discussing on page 130 and goes, um, like I said, several pages into it. And I'm going to kind of hit on the more important ones. So again, we've talked about competent practice. Um, but informed consent, there's a few slides later, we're going to talk about what's involved in conform, informed consent. But if you are getting consent for um, an EGD or some type of um, test, you you have to make sure your patient is competent um, to, do, to sign that consent. And we'll talk about that again in a few slides. Um, and so making sure that your patient is able to sign that consent um, is a good legal safeguard. Um, patient education, I cannot stress this enough. You are responsible for educating your patient. So um, we're gonna talk about nursing process and I always laugh because um, students will be like, oh, my patient's going home today and um, there's nothing wrong. I can't find any nursing problems or nursing diagnosis. But every patient that's going home requires discharge teaching or patient education. So they automatically have a knowledge deficit because they don't know what's expected of them or what they're supposed to be doing when they get home. And it is your job as the nurse to provide that education and then to document that you did provide that education. Um, within the hospital, you know, it's your job if you're going to give your patient incentive spirometer to sit there and educate the patient that you taught them how to use it. And then you need to document that. So it's very important. That is a legal safeguard. If you are documenting, if you're providing a patient education and you're documenting it, you are going to be um, legally um, safeguarded with that. Following the physician order um, and questioning it when it doesn't sound right, you know, if you get a, an order for morphine and it sounds like an unreasonably high dose, you know, are you calling the physician saying this doesn't sound, you know, like the correct dosing for this patient, it sounds too high? Are you calling the pharmacy and saying, you know, what's wrong with this medication? And, and, and following the chain of command, if you um, really feel like this medication um, should not be given to my patient for whatever reason. But also making sure you're um, following those orders correctly. You know, that video, again, points out that that nurse that pulled the wrong medication and it ultimately killed that patient, she didn't check the med with the patient's um, orders or the physician's orders. Delegating um, the nursing care and accepting that care. So are we delegating correctly, you know, we kind of mentioned delegation, but, you know, you're delegating to an unlicensed um, personnel those vital signs. You're still responsible for those vital signs on that patient. So you have to follow up and make sure they they were uh, that the person did get those vital signs. And if you're questioning them, you need to go in and get another set yourself. Um, same with PNs, you know, understanding what can be delegated to you and what can't. You know, I mentioned in the Nurse Practice Act, it says that, you know, LPNs aren't supposed to do that initial head-to-toe assessment, but then they can do follow-up assessments after that. So if a nurse, you know, an RN says, hey, um, I'm giving you in this admission and um, you're fine, you can go ahead and get the head-to-toe assessment, you need to stop and say, no, that's not under my scope of practice, I need you to get it, and then I'll, you know, follow up after that. Um, I've already hit documentation really hard, the previous slide. Um, appropriate use of social media, this falls into HIPAA. Um, you know, if we're not using social media correctly, um, you know, we can be liable, um, we can, you know, be sued for a HIPAA violation. So making sure we're not posting things about our patient on social media. Um, making sure that, you know, we're not taking pictures and posting those type of things. Um, the second slide talks about, and I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it here and then not put 
um, audio with it. Um, having adequate staffing. You know, if you come in and you feel like you are being unsafe because your patient load is too much, it may be time to look for a different job because um, that could be putting your license at jeopardy if, if the facility doesn't have adequate staffing. Um, making sure, so this is a good time to talk about incident reports. So should an incident come, um, and this happens a lot, you have a patient who, I'm giving an example, um, is at high risk for falls. And, you know, you've set a bad alarm, um, but somehow they've still gotten up and they fell before you could get into the room. Um, it doesn't mean you're liable or negligent, but you should fill out an incident report. Um, and an incident report um, is, you know, you want to know, you know, what you observed or saw or what you didn't see happen. Um, you want to you know, assess your patient afterwards and kind of document that. You want to um, call the physician and make them aware. You'll usually call a family member too, just to make them aware. And you file that with, with your facility. That never um, is put into a patient's chart. When you're um, charting on the patient, you know, you can chart, um, you know, patient fell and kind of chart your head to toe in their documentation, but you don't want to, um, you don't need to put in that documentation incident report file. You don't need to do that. But we do need to fill out incident reports because we look at those to improve patient safety. We look at those to improve our care. So if we start to see, um, you know, incidents of falls and all these patients had bed alarms on, we're going to start to question what's going on with that brand of um, bed alarms or do we need something else in place? Um, like a community's recently gotten these, um, I think they're called safe sitters, which are like cameras monitoring the patient. So we need those incident reports filled out for that reason. Um, understanding um, your student liability. So when you are in practice, um, the same kind of scope of practice or um, student liability falls with you. You know, if, you know, you go in and, um, you know, a lot of times with skills and things where, you know, there's certain things that you have to do with an instructor. And let's say you don't follow those rules. So, you know, one of the rules is if you're going to put a Foley catheter in a patient, you go with your instructor to do that. Let's say you don't follow that rule. You go in on your own. You put that Foley catheter in, and the patient gets a cauti or UTI afterwards, um, possibly because, you know, you broke sterile technique, but no one was really watching you. Um, you could be liable, and it would not be your nursing instructor. It would be you yourself because anybody under those other, you know, it's that standard of care, what a prudent person would do in that situation. So a student would take their instructor with them to do that. So understanding that student liability, that you are still liable um, for your actions. Um, and so if you want, you can look over this next slide, kind of hit on a few of them there, and then we're gonna go on to safeguards to competent practice on slide 25. Again, we've talked about some of these, but they're just more safeguards to competent practice that are listed on here. And again, we've already said developing and maintaining that interpersonal communication with that patient, that nurse-patient relationship is very important. Um, but respecting your legal boundaries and practice, we've hit on that. Following your institutional's procedures and policies. So if you don't know something or you are unsure about caring for something, I cannot stress enough that pulling the policy and procedure at the inst or, you know, the facility you're at and reading through that and following that is a legal safeguard for competent practice. We want you pulling those. They're there for a reason. Um, and they're there to assist you. Making sure you're evaluating your proposed assignment. You know, if you look at your assignment, it is okay to stop and say, you know what, I've got, you know, these three patients, um, you know, they're all brand new post-ops. Um, this one's getting, you know, the fourth one's getting blood and, and something else. Like to say, that is too much. I'm not taking this assignment or we need to change up some of these patients in the assignments. You have to be an advocate for yourself. Um, and you are just trying to safeguard yourself. And, and by acknowledging um, what you feel 
you can handle. Um, you always want to keep careful documentation. I've, I've said that multiple, multiple times. Um, but also keeping current in your nursing knowledge and skills. This is where we keep up to date on, um, you know, what research is out there, that evidence-based practice and following that. So again, um, this, this slide is really just, we've reiterated it, but safeguards to competent practice. This slide's about issues that affect competence, um, competent practice. Um, one is nurse fatigue. So if you do not get enough sleep or you are working too long of a shift, you know, any more shifts are 12 hours, and let's say you're there um, 16 to 20 hours, that's too long. Um, fatigue nurses are more likely to express concern that they made a wrong decision um, or a, a patient error um, when they have nurse fatigue. Um, and then, you know, we put it right in here. Students should be in the habit to be rested before appearing for clinical. You should not be working the night shift the night before and then showing up to clinical the next morning because you are more likely to injure or hurt a patient. And we, we don't, you know, don't do it. Don't schedule yourself to work that night shift the night before. Um, further, your book um, goes on and talks about the impaired nurse, and I put a page number in here. It's box 7-4. It is on page um, 133, and it describes signs and symptoms to watch for. You know, one of the things that um, you really need to make sure of and, and is when you are given access to the Pixis machine, or however your facility dispenses medication, and you're giving a given a password, you don't share that with somebody um, because you don't want them getting in under your name and taking medication. Likewise, you know, if you log in and grab a med and somebody comes in the med room behind you and says, hey, um, I need to grab this real quick. Can you just leave that open? Um, you don't do that because people who are seeking um to steal narcotics or drugs, they will find any little way they can to get into the uh, medication pixels. And um, you don't want a discrepancy to happen that's under your name that you know you didn't cause. So this book talks about indications that a nurse may have a substance abuse. You might notice behavioral changes. Um, maybe they're suddenly showing up late all the time or they're taking super long breaks and you can't find them. Um, are they trying to leave early? You may start to know they have excessive number of mistakes, including medication errors. That um, can be a, a sign. Um, your book says frequent trips to the bathroom. And then you might start to know narcotic discrepancies, so the incorrect narcotic account um, or count, large amounts of narcotic, um, narcotic wastage. So just being aware of those things. Um, you know, anytime you get a med out of the, Pixis machine within the hospital or, you know, your, however, um, all narcotics have to be counted. So you have to enter a count before you even pull the med. Um, so if you start to know a discrepancy, it, it could be a sign that there's a problem. And so just watch for that. And like I said, there is a, a box in your textbook that talks about that. So I told you earlier in um, the the voiceover that we would get to informed consent and what that means. And that is a safeguard for nurses. You have to get informed consent. And so your book gives a great um, box. It is on page 133. It's box 7-5. And this is kind of the elements that you have to have um, that prove that you have gotten informed consent. So the first is disclosure. You have to tell the patient about the procedure. Um, the book describes this as you have to tell the patient the nature of the procedure, the risks that are involved, um, and the probabilities of the risk and the benefits, alternatives, and the fact that no outcomes can be guaranteed. So that is disclosure. Comprehension. Does your patient, um, can they understand it? So comprehension is can correctly repeat in his or her own words that for which the patient is giving consent. So can they repeat back to you, um, I understand I'm having surgery to have my appendix removed. Um, competent, are they competent enough to decide this or make this decision? You know, if you have a dementia patient, you know, that patient's probably not competent to make that decision and they may have to have a family member step in um, to give the consent. 
So your book defines the competence as the patient understands the information needed to make the decision and is able to reason um, in accord with a relatively consistent set of values and can communicate a preference. And then the last one is volunteer. And as I said, every patient has the right to refuse treatment. So did they voluntarily sign the consent form? Um, they weren't forced to sign it. Um, all their questions were answered. They were competent. So you need all four of these elements in order to have informed consent. And if there's an element missing, let's say you did have a patient because you didn't have, you know, you didn't want to wait and take the time to have a um, competent family member come in and, and sign consent. So you had a confused dementia type patient sign their consent form. Well, they weren't competent. So you didn't have that element. So, you know, then you would be at risk of being liable if anything happens. So we want to make sure you have, you understand what these elements of informed consent are for. And again, um, they are in a box in your textbook, box 7-5 on page 133. The rest of the things going in, I'm going to hit on um, information contained in an incident report, slide 31. Um, the rest of your book talks about different things like types of risk man management programs um, and, you know, different safety programs. And I'm not going to go too in-depth with that. Um, so the last slide you'll hear me do a voiceover is on um, slide 31. So this slide is information contained in an incident report. And so I talked about that a little bit when I said there's legal safeguards and you always want to fill out an incident report if something happens. So this is the information um, that goes into that. You always want to give the complete name of the person and the name of witnesses that saw anything, if there are any, a factual account of the incident, the date, time, and place the incident occurred, pertinent characteristics of the person involved. So, um, you know, that could be that you... Um, talk about your assessment beforehand. Uh, maybe you talk about um, the patient was confused to person, place, and time. Um, patient was reminded um, not to get out of bed. Call bell was in place. Um, bed alarm was on. And, um, and those type of things. Any equipment or resources being used, like I just said, a bed alarm involved. Um, any other important variables. And then documentation by... Um, physician um, of a medical examination of the person involved. So the doctor does need to come in and examine the patient. And so those should be included. The last thing, I'm, I can't remember if there's a slide coming up on this or not, but I do want to hit them, um, is a sentinel event and a never event and understanding those two. So your book and, and these um, terms are on page 130 of your textbook. But a sentinel event your book describes as an unexpected occurrence involving death or serious physical or psychological injury or the risk of thereof. And so it gives some example. For instance, um, a suicide um, operative and post-operative complications that happened um, that were unexpected and, and the patient did end up dying from them. Then your book goes on to describe never events. And never events are just what they sound like. They should never happen. And so it, it, it gives the definition. Um, it's a, s a serious reportable event, extremely rare medical errors that should never happen to a patient. Um, these are termed never events. And those errors include, um, can be um, surgeries performed on the wrong body part or on the wrong patient. Um, perhaps um, they left a foreign object into the patient, um, so those type of things. And so, um, you know, the case that, the video we watched, the Z-Dog video, so the never event um, was what happened to that patient never should have happened. Um, but it also was a sentinel event because it ultimately re um, caused that patient to die. Um, those unexpected occurrences that happened um, during her stay, um, it, she did die. But it, I, I like to term it more as a never event. 
Um, she never should have been given that medication. Um, she should have been monitored or she should have never been left alone in that scan. Um, so those are the type of things um, I want you to remember as a never event. Um, that is all I'm going to discuss in this legal chapter. Um, and again, if you have any questions, you can always ask me in lecture on those questions. Um, but those are the big things that I wanted to hit with you in this chapter. Thanks.